Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first BU Student Faculty Forum of this year, our fourth year in existence. Let me welcome those of you who have attended before and those of you who are joining us for the first time. I'm Virginia Sapiro, Professor of Political Science and Dean Emerita of the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. When I'm not teaching courses on elections or gender and politics or political psychology, I spend as much time as I can growing vegetables and flowers and baking. The BU Student Faculty Forums are sponsored by the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground and the Dean of Students Office. They are designed to bring the BU community together to discuss important current issues of all sorts. It was founded on the premises that we have a lot to talk about together and that one important contribution faculty can make to your informed and independent thinking and action about the critical issues of our day is to share with you a little bit of what we have learned from our own professional expertise and research. I'm very pleased that tonight's forum is co-sponsored by the Department of Political Science and the law school as the final in a four part series on the election. As many of you already know, each forum has two parts. First, a panel of faculty with great professional knowledge about the topic will offer brief presentations based on their expertise. These will each last for less than seven minutes. I know that because I have the power to cut off their microphones. Then we should have about 45 minutes for you to join with us in some good discussion on the topic. The discussion will operate a little differently from usual, obviously, rather than having our usual open mic process we do when we're face to face. Please submit questions through the chat function in Zoom. Uh, when it is time for discussion, I'll select, uh, uh, not I will select, but Pedro Falci will select from the questions you've submitted. You can submit those questions at any time during the discussion. And as always, we will finish at eight o'clock on the dot. Um, let me first introduce my co-panelists and then I'm gonna give some brief remarks and then we'll move through to each of them. I'm going to introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. Lauren Mattioli is Assistant Professor of Political Science and a specialist on American governmental institutions with particular focus on interbranch relations and gender politics. She will be talking about elections in a time of COVID. David Glick is Associate Professor of Political Science, Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department and Faculty Director of MetroBridge at the BU Initiative on Cities, where he is also one of the leaders of the Menino Survey of Mayors. His teaching and research focuses widely in American politics, including especially political institutions, notably law and courts, and local politics and policy. He will talk about polling and also about litigation in Pennsylvania. Tina Martin is an Edward R. Murrow award-winning Emmy-nominated television host and reporter for Local USA, a, a national television magazine style series on WGBH World Channel Network. Tina is also an associate professor of the practice of journalism at Boston University. For several years, she reported regularly for the WGBH local television program, Greater Boston, and has served as a fill-in host for Basic Black. On the radio side, she reported for WGBH's 89.7 FM during the local broadcasts of NPR's Morning Edition and All Things Considered. She will talk mostly about the issues of race in the election, as well as some other matters. Maxwell Palmer is Assistant Professor of Political Science and a Junior Faculty Fellow at the Hariri Institute. He has three main areas of research, political careers and the returns to office, local politics and institutions, redistricting and voting rights. He's also done substantial work as an expert witness on redistricting and voting rights. He will focus on the transition and issues that President Biden will face. Graham Wilson is Professor of Political Science and Director of the BU Initiative on Cities. He teaches American and Comparative Politics 
including courses on interest groups, business and politics, and American institutions. He began his career at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom and taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison before moving to BU in 2007. He will talk about some constitutional issues and the future of Trumpism. Toby Berkowitz is an associate professor of advertising in the College of Communication, where he teaches political campaigns. His doctorate is from the Wayne State University, where he wrote his dissertation on the objectives of political TV advertising. He worked for 30 years as a political media consultant, doing media buying, strategy, and production in races for Senate, Congress, and governor. In the 1992 Democratic presidential primary, he was on the Senator Tom Harkin campaign. If Harkin had been elected president, Toby would be hosting this week with Toby Berkowitz and George Stephanopoulos would be sitting on his panel. He will look forward to what's going to happen in the parties after this season and looking forward to Gulp 2022. And with that, I am going to open with a few comments um, just quickly to give some background on things that I think my co-panelists are not going to cover. And while I'm doing this, I will look for my share screen. And you should have my screen. Yes? Yes. So just a few very, very quick things. I'm going to get rid of all you guys. Um, turnout this year, as everybody knows, this is a graph of turnout in the presidential elections from 1904 to 2020. Um, as you'll see, and as you all expect, I'm sure, this is the highest turnout we've seen in a long, long time. You see a lot of up and downs over time. We've hit a, a serious trough, but note that this election was not unusual in one sense, and that is that turnout has been increasing basically fairly steadily since 1996. Um, the state of play currently, I think that's what I wanted to do. Yes, the state of play currently in the presidential election, most of you know this, so I won't go in depth. In the popular vote, Biden at the moment is ahead 50.7% to Trump's 47.6%. This will change a little. In the electoral vote, Biden's ahead 279 versus 214. He is currently leading in Arizona. He is currently leading in Georgia. And Trump is leading in North Carolina. So it's not all solved, but we know pretty much what's going to happen. State of play in the Senate elections. We now, as of this afternoon, have, that's the wrong way around, 49 Republicans and 48 Democrats. I did this right before we got here. We have two runoff elections in Georgia. Alaska is still listed as undetermined, but seriously, folks, that's a Republican race. The state of play in the House elections, at the moment we have 218 Democrats who flipped three seats. We have 201 Republicans who flipped nine seats for a six seat gain, and we still have 16 seats to go. Uh, one thing is the amount of money that's been spent. I don't think anybody else is talking about money, so I wanted to show this from Real Clear Politics. Here you see the bar graphs of the uh, amount of money that were spent on all federal elections, that's presidency, Congress, Senate, and so forth, since 1998. And as you can see, and as we all expected, this year is blowing everything out of the water. Um, just quickly, sorry about uh, the pickup of not very good print, but here are the top Senate race expenditures. And if you eyeball this very quickly, you can see that uh, Senate expenditures are much greater than they've ever been. You can also see that the expenditure of money did not create winning races. And in fact, it's quite notable this year that um, challengers spent a ton of money for basically unsuccessful races. The top house race expenditures, likewise, we see a ton of money being spent in various places. You'll notice that the top spenders are not by and large people whose uh, seats were, were uncertain. 
but people who won with great margins and also, of course, the leadership of the House who spend their money on other places other than themselves. You'll notice that there was a huge amount of Republican money spent to try to unseat AOC, our alum, and uh, Ilhan Omar, and uh, it seems to have had virtually no effect. So uh, that's it for me. And uh, then we'll move on to Lauren Mattioli. Thanks, Gina. Hi, everyone. Um, so I um, <clears throat> talked today about presidential transitions and um, a lot of the questions and a lot of the things that my students talked about in class were all related to, to COVID. So that gave me a strong indication that this would be a topic of interest to, to you guys as well. Um, so I'm just gonna, I have some slides for you um, just to sort of give you a sense of, of what I'll be talking about, so. And can you see the election 2020 thing okay? Can I just get a thumbs up? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right. Um, so while our collective attention for the past uh, few weeks has been on the presidential election, COVID-19 continues to surge. As of election day in 2020, the US had over 10 million cases and over 200,000 deaths from the disease. The cumulative toll of this virus that it has had and will continue to have on human physical, mental, and financial health will likely never be adequately measured. Suffice it to say, the US has suffered myriad ways due to COVID. And in these brief remarks, I wanna focus on a particular set of effects I perceive COVID to have had on the 2020 election. And we'll speculate on some, some long-term effects the virus might have for our politics as well. These effects fall into three broad categories. The uh, mass political behavior, campaign strategy, and issue salience. So um, I wanna start with uh, mass political behavior. So, and I'll divide this into uh, the effect of COVID on mass political behavior and voting and on uh, political interest and media consumption. So specifically on voting, I think coronavirus's immediate effects was that it increased concerns about voting safely. People were worried about how to engage in political activities like uh, showing up in a space that is difficult to socially distance waiting in lines, crowded polling stations, uh, potentially infected poll worker, et cetera, et cetera. So the short-term consequence of COVID for voting was that it led many states to pursue something they had never done before. It, it, it prompted them to experiment with vote early or vote by mail and encouraging voters to use one of those alternate methods. And this has had a lot of consequences. One most notably being the actual counting of ballots takes longer. And so our election results were slow to come in or at least slower than previous years. 36 million people voted early in person, 65 million people mailed in their ballots. And in some states, early voting constituted more than 100% of 2016 turnout. This is just a map that shows in, in uh, across states, what proportion or what percentage of the 2016 turnout did 2020, or this is just early votes, this isn't voting in person constitute. Um, and some of the states that we were watching sort of with bated breath, Texas, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina um, were, were particularly affected by the popularity of early voting. On a long-term uh, basis, I think that this effect of COVID might have a couple of consequences. The first is at an institutional level, which is that the success of early voting and using these types of ballots, mail-in ballots and uh, early voting shows that this is a viable strategy that uh, though there are consequences for how long it took results to come in, this is uh, a way to conduct elections at the mass level, which is often a, a resistant 
uh, claim that states make to discouraging or not allowing at will vote by mail. So I think that those will be more difficult arguments to make moving forward. The second is on the personal level. Voting is habit forming, as political scientists like to say. Um, and so whether you learned something about voting by voting by mail, that is that it's easy uh, or it doesn't take very long or that with a little bit of research, you can figure it out and, and fill out your ballot successfully. Um, or maybe you just develop a habit and stick to it. We, uh, those of us who, who think that more voter turnout is a good thing, will be encouraged and, and hopefully that there will be trickle down effects of uh, the massive voter turnout this year. Uh, the other consequence of COVID, I think, for uh, mass political behavior is media exposure. So at the beginning, uh, less so now, but at the beginning of the pandemic, when people were sheltering in place, media consumption went way up. Uh, people were watching uh, twice as much TV as they had at the time, at that time, the prior year. And that didn't just include comfort TV, like The Office and Golden Girls. Cable news hit record viewership. Uh, cable news websites were getting record numbers of hits. And in a, rec in a survey of registered voters, 62% said they were following COVID news closely as compared to the presidential election, which is about 30%. So in this low information where people didn't know a lot about COVID and how to protect themselves and their families, and they're in this environment where they're staying in place, they're watching more TV, they're consuming more media. In the short term, that means people are being exposed to a lot of content, whether that's on purpose, they're seeking out news about politics or they're getting it sort of accidentally because the news covers stuff about politics and it covers stuff about, about COVID. So in general, this increases people's levels of awareness and knowledge. Uh, but an important thing to note is that in consuming a lot of content that increases the probability that people are exposed to misinformation, which is particularly problematic for those who opt into information environments where misinformation is common, like social media. Um, so in a, restricted, in a restricted media environment, you can increase your uh, level of knowledge, but it might be misplaced. Right? You might think you know a lot about a particular uh, conspiracy, right, or something, but it's not actually reflective of reality. But this is still uh, a source of some kind of information. In the long term, this can have consequences for people's uh, beliefs about how the political world worked and what we consume in media while we are experiencing a political event affects how we react to those events. Uh, and so in the long term, people use this media consumption to form their beliefs about what a, how big a threat COVID is and how it was being handled and who was responsible based on what types of information people opted into. I think a good example of this uh, is this survey by the Pew Research Center, which shows uh, between Republicans and lean Republicans and Democrats and leaning Dems, uh, just the answer to the question of the US has controlled the outbreak as much as it could have versus it has not controlled the outbreak as much as it could have. And if you compare Dems versus Republicans, those that are consuming what we would describe as ideological news, like Fox News and talk radio versus on the conservative side versus MSNBC, CNN, NPR, New York Times, Washington Post, um, they're having completely different reactions uh, and that to and forming completely different opinions about how the outbreak is being handled. So that's going to have trickle down effects in in certainly to the campaigns and then how the campaigns craft their messages. All right. Uh, so I want to turn to uh, campaign strategy as a second kind of arm of how I think COVID affects the elections. The immediate consequences were that the Biden campaign focused their COVID messaging on the idea that the Trump administration mismanaged COVID, right? It was one of many examples of failure that they portrayed the, the, the Trump administration as having committed. They emphasized the tragedy of the pandemic. They expressed, uh, and by they, I mean, um, President-elect Biden, Vice President-elect Harris, and many of their campaign surrogates, 
they expressed empathy, empathy for a fearful public and those that had taken ill and families of those that had that had passed. And that allowed Biden to invoke his own biography, which is which is rife with with heartbreak and loss. The uh, Trump ed campaign and it contrasted this, and this is these are the the messaging words in red. Um, Trump analogized his personal defeat of the virus to that of his administration, and according to the White House, COVID has been controlled; it has been beaten back, um, and we know that that messaging changed over time. Initially, the virus was treated like a like it's just like the flu or it's a hoax, a hoax, or Trump didn't know anybody who had it. And then after contracting it, said that, you know, don't let it dominate your life. And so that was all about minimizing threat, minimizing the president's sort of like, even if I'm responsible for it, it's not that big of a deal. And if I am responsible for it, I've, I've dealt with it. Um, and then, of course, diverting attention away from the from COVID to other things like threats to the economy imposed by lockdowns or other issues entirely, like Hunter Biden's laptop or Hillary Clinton or or whatever the flavor of the week was. Um, and so I think the short term consequence of that is that is that people linked president's actions, the president's actions to the disease and its fallout. Um, but that was colored by how they perceived the president's actions, right? So if you perceived the president's message that he was successful in beating back the virus, then that would be a huge win, right? Maybe a reason to vote for the president. Uh, and by linking the success of the economy or the health of everyday people to whoever wins the presidency, the candidates collectively raise the stakes of the election as high as possible, which I think we all felt. Um, a couple of long-term consequences, I think it- time, In the interest of time, maybe uh, wrap in a minute. Sure, I can do that. So um, uh, I think the, the messaging strategy shows that we need to hold, uh, you need to establish threat and hold an opponent responsible and uh, has shown that the, the compassion strategy, which has been much maligned, can be successful. Um, I'm gonna skip over uh, campaign strategy as uh, a form of uh, uh, an influence of COVID. And I just wanna just briefly touch on some ways that uh, COVID raised issue salience. Obviously the one of healthcare is really obvious, but it also increased general feelings of uncertainty and threat, which raised the salience of law and order. Uh, and made that, that message of President Trump land well. And uh, COVID shutdowns, unemployment, market, market uncertainty brought in a, a recession. Normally incumbents are punished for a bad economy. Uh, and so that had consequences, I think, for the success of the Trump campaign. In general, I think the long-term consequences of the raised issue salience across health, security or law and order and the economy are that the pandemic kind of revealed inequalities that already existed in the system. Uh, we kind of think of it as a stress test, the way that a cardiac, uh, a cardiologist might use a stress test to reveal where problems are in a system. I think the pandemic reveals places where we were already struggling, uh, and pulls them into stark relief. And I think the campaign really pits safety, pitted safety and prosperity against each other, that we have to choose between whether we want to protect ourselves from a virus or we want to be economically prosperous. And so I think that will be the long-term consequence of uh, the raising of issue salience of uh, COVID on the 2020 election. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have David Glick, who's uh, been attacked by the internet gods. So I believe he's here at the moment, but if we lose him, it's the internet gods. Yeah, hi, thank you everyone. Attacked actually by the thunderstorm internet gods. I'm out in Chicago and we just had a legit summer summer style thunderstorm, um, which is not, not normal in November, but so be it. Um, anyway, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanna talk briefly for a couple minutes um, about one of the big questions that has emerged almost immediately on election night when some of the results started coming in and has con continued and will continue probably in the popular discussion and certainly in the sort of uh, political science and political science adjacent world um, over the long term, because these are hard questions that take some time to sort out, um, which is basically what what happened with the polls. Um, and, and right, there's this the question that came up in 2016 and it came up again this year. And so just very briefly, 
um, I'm going to talk for a minute about sort of what we think at the moment, sort of what might explain polling errors in, in 2020. Um, a subset of that, sort of my uh, second half question is whether it's because of quote unquote shy Trump voters, which was one of the sort of theories floating around and if not, what, what might explain it. Um, and then finally, just at the very end, more as a question to, to raise, right, is um, should we continue, you know, are, do polls play too big a role in discussion of elections? Should we ditch the polls? Um, various forms of that question, right? And so, um, right, the short story in 2016 is that there were the national polls did reasonably well. They missed by a couple points, um, but obviously in some critical critical states that had some consist, uh, common demographic traits, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan in particular, also Ohio, Iowa, um, sort of the upper Midwest, right? They consistently missed Trump's vote share and in 2016, the misses were enough to swing the election, um, right? The, the, um, the, the polls missed on the, from one side of, the, of winning to losing essentially, right? And this, this year, it looks like they missed um, by similar amounts, possibly even more, um, but not quite enough um, to actually flip at least in those three states from, from one candidate winning to another, um, right? And so one thing that's, I think, important to, to understand, right? And the reason we have these questions is because polling, polling is obviously hard, right? It's something we, we talk to our students about, right? And how polling, good polling does not work, um, unfortunately, by just calling a thousand people um, and then reporting that, you know, 51 of them percent 51% of them said Biden and 49% of them said Trump, right? Pollsters know um, that people are, uh, some groups of people are easier or harder to reach. Some groups of people are easier or harder to get on the phone, are more likely to want to talk to pollsters, right? And so any good polling analysis is basically a combination of collecting data about, you know, people across a variety of demographic traits, and then a conjecture about what the actual demographics of all the people who vote will look like. Right, what percent will be Democrats? What percent will be Republicans? What percent will be older? What percent will be younger? Right, and so if you hear talk about sort of polling waiting, that's basically what's going on. Right, so the easy example is is something like if you called a thousand people and got you know sixty percent of them were Democrats, you would probably know that you're getting something is wrong, and that if you just reported those results, you'd probably get a big skew in in one one direction or another. Right, so pollsters try to make adjustments. And, and if you're interested in this, I think the best way to understand this is four years ago, the New York Times upshot, which is really good on all this stuff, did an exercise where they collected the data, um, which is the other hard part of polling, obviously, and gave it the same set of data, the same spreadsheet to four very good pollsters and asked them to analyze this as you would normally and get your best good faith estimate, right? This is not pollsters trying to reach a result that's favorable to one candidate or another, right? And they all came up with different estimates of the sort of gap between Clinton and Trump, right? And why is that? It's because they had slightly different conjectures about what the electorate would actually look like um, in terms of some of these demographics, right? So when we talk about um, waiting, right? So the, so the the answer people came up with four years ago is that a lot of polls did not wait by education, right? So that they didn't account for the fact that maybe they were they were missing um, some of the uh, Trump voters without college degrees, for example, right? They were less likely to participate in polls. And if you had accounted for that fact, you would have gotten a better estimate of Trump's share, right? So they did, they waited on the obvious things like partisanship, but not education. So this, the, this year people thought, okay, we got this figured out. We waited by education. As it turns out, obviously that didn't work so well, right? So what's the answer, right? Um, again, the question is what types of things might mean that the people in your poll that you're not accounting for are not representative of the bigger population, right? And so I think the leading theories are not the shy Trump voters, right? The, the, the reality is the bigger miss was actually in the Senate elections, right? There were some people, so there seems to be even more uh, harder to estimate support for people like Lindsey Graham and Susan Collins and others who are not Donald Trump, right? So there would have to be shy, all kinds of people, not just not just Trump, right? And that doesn't, it seems it's possible. There could be some of that, but that's probably not the, the sort of leading theory, right? Um, and so, I, you know, I think the most common ideas kind of floating around right now as, as possibilities um, are, are, are sort of other traits about people that make them more or less likely to answer the phone. Right or to, to want to talk to pollsters, and I think there's 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 theories on both sides of the of the split. So one is that um, the people there's a subset of hardcore Trump voters, right, who have um, less trust in institutions in general. And so if someone calls from the New York Times or whatever and says I'm doing a poll with the New York Times, they're just likely to to hang up, right. And so what does that mean? It means even once you account for making sure you have some people with 
without college degrees, making sure you have enough Republicans and so on and so forth in your sample of polls, the ones that you do have are still not representative of that group, right? So if the Republicans you end up having are least likely to include the hardest core Trump voters who are least likely to wanna to talk to a pollster and instead you have your set of Republicans actually includes a disproportionate amount of you know, suburban Republicans who might actually be voting Biden this year, right? Even if you, you make some weighting adjustments, you're gonna end up missing, right? Or if your sample of people without college degrees still misses the subset of those who are most likely to vote for Trump, um, even once you wait by education, right, you count the people without college degrees, the right proportion to the electorate, you're still not going to get, get the right estimate, right? So that's, that seems like the, you know, fits with a lot of things we understand, um, and it's a hard problem to, to solve, obviously, right? There's also potentially the flip side thing going on, which is that high education people, especially who are maybe extra enthusiastic this year about talking to pollsters and telling them who they're going to vote for and that they're going to vote for Biden and so on and so forth, right? They might be the most likely to talk to pollsters. And again, you might then get a skew because the, the set of Democrats or the set of people with college degrees um, who are in your sample are not actually representative even of their group in the sur survey, let alone all of the other groups you're trying to conjecture to, right? So I think those are something along those lines, probably is a better theory. Um, than just education waiting because we waited by education this year and missed by at least as much in the exact same places. Um, it just turned out it didn't always flip the election, right? I think a couple other just super fast. I know we're, we're running out of time here. Um, two other possibilities just to think about. One is that, right, the other thing polls try to do is ascertain who's likely to vote. And in a year with early voting, right, um, Democrats were going to be recorded as definitely to vote because a lot of Biden supporters voted early and told the pollsters I already voted. Um, and it turns out that a lot of people there were a lot of people who were definitely going to vote. They were also 100% likely to vote for Trump, but who hadn't yet voted. And so presumably the pollsters may have assumed some fraction of them were not actually going to vote because normally, right, you assume some some fraction of people don't show up to vote. And it turns out they all did, right, which is related to another challenge, which is maybe a slightly different version of the, not really the, the shy Trump voter, but that, um, you know, polls generally try to, right, make projections about who's going to show up to vote. And Trump is actually really good at getting low propensity voters uh, out to vote. And so polls might just miss that, right? If there's a subset of people who traditionally might not vote, they might show up as an unlikely voter in a poll, but because Trump's on the ballot are actually definitely going to come out to vote, right? That's another way the polls could miss, right? And then a final thing, um, and this probably dovetails a little bit off what Professor Mattioli was talking about with COVID, right? That obviously affected um, traditional sort of get out the vote exercises, right? There are some Democrats, and obviously these were hard choices about whether to stick to an online only campaign or knock on people's doors as traditionally would have happened, right? Um, one state where it seems like Democrats did more of that traditional thing was Minnesota and the polls in Minnesota seem to have missed less than in, in some of the other upper Midwest states. So there's some speculation that maybe some of those, those um, uh, again, it's too early to tell, lots of places are still counting votes. So we don't really even know the final total, but we do know there were some pretty big misses, right? Um, so with all that said, and I know that was, uh, I sort of rushed through, right? We could do a whole class or more um, just explaining sort of how polling works and some speculation as to what, have, what might've gone wrong. Obviously the big question going forward are, should we ditch the polls, right? I think um, there's certainly arguments to be made that too many people, um, at least too many people who spend a lot of time online, spend too much time tracking, waiting for the latest poll to drop from wherever or, you know, updating 538 and things like that. And, and there's obviously a bit of an obsession with these things It's people follow it like sports. Um, that may or may, that may not be super healthy. Um, the reality is the alternatives are not great either, right? A world of, you know, polls that are off by a couple percent or even a little more are problematic, but so is a world where it's just anecdote where the only information that comes out is what campaigns want to leak to reporters, where we're going around trying to guess based on, you know, vote parades or yard signs or other things, sort of which candidate is actually more popular in the electorate, right? There are, you know, it's not clear to me or lots of people that that's actually going to result in better estimates than even imperfect polling, right? Um, I think the final bigger question for political scientists and others is, um, do the polls actually affect voters and voting behavior, right? On either side, do they make some, in this case, Democrats overconfident that they might not turn out to vote? Do they depress Republican turnout? You know, do they, um, that I think is a bigger normative and systematic question, which I don't think we have a great answer to yet, other than that there is some good research suggesting that, you know, reporting probabilities that X candidate is going to win does actually affect people's uh, enthusiasm to vote or whatever, and that there are at a minimum probably better ways to report and talk about polls than, than some of what we have so far. So I'm um, happy to answer questions. Sorry, I went fast, uh, thanks.
Thank you, Tina Martin. Hi, um, all right, I'm definitely gonna try to do this in under seven minutes, I think I can do it. Um, Toby, I'll, I'll give you a Starbucks coffee if I can't get it done in less than seven minutes. All right, um, so I wanna talk about um, the uh, black vote and I also wanna talk about some things that are near and dear to my heart, which is um, some things that may have worked against uh, President Trump um, specifically the treatment of uh, journalists, uh, you know, with the whole fake news campaign, um, specifically uh, black journalists, journalists of color um, in the White House press corps. Um, but let's talk about the black voters. Black voters made up 11% uh, of the national elect electorate, excuse me, nine out of 10 of them supported Biden. That's according to AP VoteCast. And that was a survey of more than 110,000 voters. Um, both of them, both that support was on par with Hillary Clinton, but more people came out for Biden. Um, in large populations in Wayne County, Michigan, which that includes Detroit, and in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which Biden won by 20,000 points, you know, that was essentially, um, you know, those voters of color getting out to the polls. Um, when we look at Georgia, we look at the efforts of Stacey Abrams, who registered 66,000 voters, new voters, um, in order to help you know, Biden, you know, uh, get some numbers there in Georgia. Uh, the other thing that may have uh, worked for Joe Biden is the selection of Kamala Harris, who is the first woman. She's the first black woman. She's the first Asian woman uh, to be a, you know, vice president ever. Um, uh, Kamala Harris belongs to a, a, what we call HBCU, Historically Black University. That's Howard University. She's also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, which is a historically black sorority founded um, on the campus of Howard University in 1908. That sorority itself has about 300,000 members. There are nine organizations that are historically black sororities and fraternities that have those same amount of members. And so all of those organizations, including mine, I'm a member of a historically black sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, all of these organizations uh, created voter, ridiculous voter registration drives all across the country to get people out to vote. So that is another huge, huge uh, win for, um, for the Biden campaign. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is when we, I mean, not just in reference to, you know, people of color, black folks, but, you know, we think about President, uh, President Trump's, um, you know, time in office, and there has just been a um, slew of disrespect um, to all kinds of people. Um, but particularly when we look at George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, you know, George Floyd killed in Minneapolis um, uh, with a knee on his neck for, you know, eight minutes by a police officer, um, you know, unbelievable never acknowledged by the president whatsoever. None of this, any of it was ever acknowledged by the president. Um, you think about uh, Barack Obama. Um, I was actually in Connecticut when Sandy Hook happened. And I'm not sure how many people remember Sandy Hook um, when 26 uh, teachers and students, more students, um, kindergarten, kindergartners were uh, shot and killed. I remember President Obama coming to Connecticut three times um, I don't ever remember hearing President Trump acknowledge anything that was going on in the country, you know, other than when he got COVID, he told everybody, you know, everything's going to be okay, just go ahead and live your life while he's gone to Walter Reed Medical Center and got the best medical treatment in the world. Um, the other thing that may have worked against President Trump is he is a president of some very negative firsts, refusing to put a picture of President Obama up in the White House. Um, refusing to acknowledge the deaths of um, Congressman John Lewis and Elijah Cummings. So many people that I've spoken to um, may not have loved Joe Biden, but they certainly did not appreciate President Trump whatsoever. Um, so those are some of the things that I've noticed in terms of just watching this, you know, as a journalist and as a professor, um, unfold. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is um, I actually spoke to uh, one of my friends who is a White House reporter, Yami Shelf Cinder, and uh, she told me that she, this is a huge relief for her, not because necessarily of, you know, having a new 
person per se, but just the treatment and the temperature of the White House. It makes it very difficult to do your job. As a journalist, when you ask a question and you're being told that you're an angry girl, you're a bad girl, you're a bad woman, et cetera. You know, so all of that, you know, kind of perfect storm of disrespect, I think really pushed many people to the polls, particularly people of color uh, to the polls uh, to vote for uh, Joe Biden. So that's my contribution, and I do have some some other uh, some other uh, observations as well. A professional journalist, she did it. <laughs> Max Palmer. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the presidential transition, and then for a minute at the end about the Georgia runoffs. So, assuming as everything currently is that. Um, Vice President Biden will become President Biden um, and nothing will change from this point forward, he and his team face an enormous task right now of the presidential transition. And this is a complicated and overwhelming effort in the best of times, and certainly we are not in the best of times. Um, the coronavirus and the recession make the transition incredibly complicated uh, and urgent. Um, and then every effort so far by President Trump and his team to delay um, the acceptance of the results and the beginning of the transition makes this problem even harder. Um, <clears throat> so the transition is a really important and incredibly complicated effort. And it really doesn't have any other parallels to any other act of government that we see or really anything else in our modern life. You know, it's not like a new CEO taking over a company where there's a team that's still in place and they can gradually hire and fire people um, to put their people in, in place. Here, we're gonna see enormous turnover of probably an entire cabinet, um, undersecretaries, deputies, almost 4, 000, over 4,000 people will ultimately be put, uh, political appointees in the new administration. So the entire upper level getting replaced all at once. And these people need background checks and they need briefings. They need access to classified information so that they can be up to speed on day one. We really can't have a lag where the new president gets sworn in and then gradually starts staffing the White House and all the key agencies, um, especially around things like national security, we need to have a really seamless transition. So the normal process, and I think very few of us knew anything about it because we just expected it to happen until this year, is that the administrator of the General Services uh, Administration, uh, obviously don't think very much about in general, um, essentially rules that the winner of the election has been ascertained. And this is one of these vague words that have some clear um, rules for guidance that we sort of, it's worked in the past because we've had a clear winner. Usually somebody wins, the other party concedes. And at that point, there's no longer a dispute about the winner uh, with the exception of being Bush v. Gore where the transition was um, heavily delayed. But even then the Clinton administration made efforts for the Bush team to start preparing for the transition uh, before that was decided. Um, so far that, that ruling has not been made and there's been a lot of efforts by the White House to say that they're not going to make any administrative ruling there. And that delays all sorts of really important aspects of the transition, like funding to pay for this effort, um, office space um, in federal buildings in DC for Biden's team to get to work, uh, access to briefing books and information, all the federal agencies. In the best of times, we only have about 75 days or so between um, the election and inauguration. So every day, every week that's lost is a really large share of this very, very short period of time. Um, and so these challenges are enormous. And the longer this election is unresolved, or at least disputed, uh, the harder a challenge this gets for Biden to come in on day one ready to take action on coronavirus, on the recession, uh, on national security, and on everything else um, going on. Um, another interesting aspect of the transition is Biden and his team need to find thousands of people to staff these roles, who many have to be Senate confirmed, others just have to pass background checks. And they've actually been working on this under federal law for about six months already. They're required to start working on it well before the election. Um, and so we should expect um, in the next few weeks, we probably, as soon as even this week or next week, uh, announcements about some White House staffers, like who the chief of staff and others will be, um, as well as probably some prominent cabinet secretaries coming out. Uh, soon as well, at least if they're trying to proceed as if it were a normal transition. But I think a really interesting thing to follow how they're going to go about it uh, in a moment where we really haven't seen any of the normal cooperation that you would expect to see. Um, 
over the summer, I listened to a podcast called Transition Lab, uh, put out by the Partnership for Public Service. And I really encourage you uh, to, to listen to it. They've done some really interesting episodes uh, in the last week or two about this transition. But all summer, uh, they interviewed all the people who ran transitions going all the way back to Jimmy Carter. Um, think about the intense complexity of these transitions and how interesting uh, they are. My family has asked me to stop talking about it um, to them, but I can tell all of you, um, this is definitely worth uh, your time and really interesting to follow um, as this all proceeds. And then just one minute on the Georgia runoffs. So it looks like, as Gina mentioned at the beginning, the majority of the Senate will be decided by two runoff elections in the first week of January in Georgia. And this is uh, a weird and unusual event that highlights um, some different election institutions that we have only in Georgia and Louisiana as well, and not in the rest of the country. So first, just by total randomness, there's two Senate elections in Georgia, one a special election and one the regular term. Um, you know, just sort of random coincidence that it is all going to end up in Georgia uh, this year. And then Georgia has this law, which is a relic of the Jim Crow era, which is that the winning candidate has to have not a plurality of the vote, like in every other uh, state except Louisiana, but a majority. And so it goes to a runoff. And often these elections are really different from the general election. There's only six, seven weeks, uh, eight weeks between uh, the two elections. They tend to be much lower turnout uh, affairs. They generally favor, uh, in recent years at least, Republican voters. And so uh, Democrats certainly face an even bigger uphill battle winning these two runoffs than they did in, say, winning the presidential election uh, last week. So interesting to follow. There's going to be a ton of money spent, a ton of attention on these two state, on these two Senate races in one state. Um, but a real large challenge for Democrats here if they want any shot of taking back the Senate. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, I think we have Graham next, right? Thank you. Thank you for uh, including me in this group. Uh, I'm going to make uh, three quick points, and if I have time, possibly uh, utter a provocation. <clears throat> the first point that I want to make is that, of course, President Trump was not elected democratically. He was elected constitutionally, but not democratically. And uh, as we all know, the popular vote has uh, often diverged or has, sig has significantly diverged, uh, in, at least in percentage terms, and sometimes in actual result from the result in the Electoral College. Very quickly, um, the uh, story is that Bush lost to Gore by 543,000 votes, 816. Trump lost to Clinton by 2,868,686 votes. At the current count, the best I could get for the current state of play in total popular vote, uh, Trump is losing to Biden by 4,635,531. They probably added another couple to that in the last few seconds, who knows. But the point that I'm making is that uh, we continue to have this danger that the Electoral College will deliver a result that's at variance with a fairly clear popular vote. The uh, vote uh, that this, this time round uh, was uh, consistent in outcome between the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. But a quick estimate this evening on the figures that I could get suggests that this time round, a change of 100,000 votes in a few states would have put Trump or kept Trump in the White House. So in other words, all uh, the last four years, we've all gone around saying, uh, only 75,000 votes in a few states uh, resulted in the defeat of Hillary Clinton. You could, if you were a Republican, uh, go around in the future saying something along the lines that only 100,000 votes in a few states decided the election. Meanwhile, the popular election, uh, the popular vote totals were very, very clear. The popular uh, vote total was a very, very clear victory for Biden. And what this reminds us of is the, I think, growing problem of democratic legitimacy or illegitimacy in the US system. Uh, we've been talking so far about the Electoral College, but we also need to keep in mind the United States Senate, where 70% of the population is represented by 30% of the senators. 
And we all know about the ludicrous contrast between California on the one hand and Wyoming on the other. And at this point, everybody tut tuts and says, yes, yes, but go back to the founding fathers and blah, blah, blah. But the point is that Americans are taught to worship the Constitution. But the reality is that the Constitution is constantly in danger of producing undemocratic outcomes and has done so with reasonable frequency in recent years at the presidential level and certainly repeatedly produces an undemocratic pattern of representation in the Senate. And we know that one of the great dangers for a Biden presidency is that if the Republicans win the Senate, which uh, unfortunately, or keep control of the Senate, which unfortunately I expect Mitch McConnell will devote himself as determinedly in leading those senators uh, those Republican senators uh, elected by a minority of the population to do whatever he can to damage a Biden presidency, just as he made trying to make uh, Barack Obama a one term president his number one priority. So that's my first point. Second point uh, is that we do have to remember that Trump got an awful lot of votes that he got, in fact, the second largest number of votes cast for a presidential candidate ever. And uh, we can talk about whether Trump actually did better or worse than his party. I think you can actually make a respectable arg argument that, that Trump did worse than the Republicans. I'm really impressed by the gains in the House of Representatives, for example. But nonetheless, he got an awful lot of votes and perhaps even uh, more strikingly, he has a degree of enthusiasm and loyalty from his followers that has very few parallels in modern American politics, particularly, I think, on the Republican side. Maybe we could say that the loyalty of liberal Democrats to Obama matches this, but certainly the uh, support amongst Republicans for W or HW, uh, or even I would suggest for, for Ronald Reagan, didn't, doesn't match the intensity of support that Trump has. Now, we've talked a lot over the last four years about what underpins that. Uh, I, uh, to some degree, is it the feeling of the being left behind economically? Uh, is it uh, race-based? Is it uh, based on uh, a determination to tr preserve a traditional white dominated America, et cetera? But I do think that, that, that we have to pay attention to the intensity of the following that Trump has uh, created for himself and will continue to command uh, even out of office in the next four years. So I think that one of the dangers that we face, and I think that Trump is very much engaged in building this right now, is the creation of a uh, movement uh, led by Trump that will constantly be there uh, trying to uh, negate the Biden administration, trying to push uh, for the sort of populist, uh, nativist perspective that Trumpism recommends. And I don't view that with any great enthusiasm. Uh, the uh, argument might be made by some of his supporters <clears throat> that actually Trump did deliver on some of his, on the promises that he made to them. We don't like to think this way, uh, usually because we are by and large not Trump supporters, but in terms of reducing immigration, yes, Trump came through in adopting hostile attitudes in trade with other countries. Yes, he came through if that's what you wanted. And I, I also think that uh, he uh, generally communicated a feeling of having some respect for those parts of the population, particularly uh, blue collar workers, particularly more rural parts of the country that I think they often feel they are denied, to put it bluntly, by folks like us. Third point that I want to make, which is a more comparative politics point, is that deep divisions do not necessarily threaten democracy. We are not used to political parties being clearly ideologically differentiated in this country, and we are getting very upset about the intensity of the conflict between them. But other democracies have lived with clear ideological differences between their parties for a long time. The British uh, with the Labour and Conservative parties, 
more dramatically in continental Europe, where there were communist parties in Italy and France, for example, that commanded the support regularly of very large shares of the electorate. So it is possible to have sharp ideological difference and still have viable democracy, but it does take respect for democratic norms, not merely democratic laws, but democratic norms. And we are seeing right now a challenge to the acceptance of democratic norms in the United States. I predicted that Trump will go on to, is going out on, on building a movement that will create problems for a constitutionally and democratically elected president. Uh, and I think that part of his movement, part of his approach will be to delegitimize a democratic outcome. So I think that unfortunately, we don't have the norms that underpin uh, the combination of democracy and clearly ideologically differentiated parties. But I think it would be just wonderful if we could get back to having those uh, democratic norms as well as that competition. And finally, finally, I can't resist a provocation. At one time, Democrats were really good at inventing slogans. They came up with things like the New Deal, the Fair Deal, uh, the Great Society. Who could possibly be against those things? I think more recently, uh, progressive Democrats have been awfully good at coming up with titles or slogans that thrill about 5% of the population and then have to spend the next six months saying, they didn't really mean what any reasonable person would have concluded from a slogan, what they mean. To me, defund the police is a clear example. Defund the police, I think to most people meant fewer police, cutting back on police uh, budgets, even if not completely abolishing police departments. I think that scared an awful lot of people and Democrats spent a lot of time explaining that defund the police didn't mean firing as many police officers as possible. It meant having more psychologists and socialists and social workers involved. And Freudian said that socialism was another example of something that didn't instinctively appeal to the bulk of the American population. So with those three quick points and one provocation, I'll stop. Thank you. And before our last speaker, Toby Berkowitz, let me remind everybody in the audience that we welcome your questions. Um, you can do that through the Q&A function of Zoom and your questions will be read and we will try to tackle them. So Toby Berkowitz. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna talk about, is it November, 2022 yet? Which is kind of ironic since we're not even done with November, 2020 yet, but we shall proceed anyway. The Dems underperformed in this election. There were very high expectations, partly because of polling, partly because of the mainstream media and the pundit class. And Biden did have a successful win, although we're not totally sure, depending which side you're on about that. But the Republicans did improve in many different places. They did much better in the House than anyone thought they would. In state legislatures, which pretty much no one pays attention to, but are very important because we're gonna reapportion and uh, after the census, if we have a census. And also a relatively disappointing Senate run. Um, the Democrats were supposed to have picked up several seats and right now as Graham and several other people have pointed out, we're battling just to hold on to perhaps even a 50-50 Senate. So all the planets should have aligned for the Democrats. Trump's approval was very low. It had been flat forever. Um, you had COVID and Black Lives Matter as very important issues, um, which did not accrue much benefit to Trump for most voters. But a lot of these things cut both ways, and that's what's really important to look at. So I'm going to look at both parties sort of towards um, 2022. First, the Democrats. There has been a constant battle for decades between the centrists and the liberals. And now you can throw in sort of the activist resistance wing with AOC and Bernie. So this is not new. And this is going to be um, very important as we go into the primaries in uh, 2022 and for the legislation that's going to be passed over the next two years, if any legislation gets passed over the next two years. You're already starting to see the blame game. Uh, did Pelosi and Schumer screw this up? Um, would it have been better if um, you know the resistance had been more 
uh, successful having their agenda driven. So you get these types of uh, questions. Um, the Democrats also are very inefficient the way they deliver the vote. Um, as was pointed out, they have a four or five million um, person lead, but much of that comes out of certain cities, out of certain states. Um, and so the reality of the way that our constitution for better or for worse has set it up disadvantages um, the Democrats. Uh, also where a lot of the growth is out in the exurbs, that's really where the battle is. Um, the suburbs, which used to be Republican went pretty much democratic, but now that's where a lot of the battle is. So as we look at, is it gonna be sort of a more moderate liberal democratic party or a much more radical liberal democratic party in 20, uh, 2022? If you look at Biden's exit poll numbers, Biden got 64% of the vote of moderates and 54% of the votes of independents. And independents are very important, especially in a lot of swing districts. So you've already got one battle shaping up there. Then you go to the Republican side, and as Graham accurately pointed out, you really have a cult of Trump, which is ironic because Trump really isn't much of a Republican. Um, and yet he is absolutely dominating um, how the party perceives itself to a large degree issues and the voters. So what the Trumpian strategy has been is to drive the base, to try to grow the base, not really worry at all about attracting broader voter segments, um, which could have a big impact when we start looking at congressional races, Senate races uh, in 2022. Um, on the other hand, as has also been pointed out, Trump did slightly better with Hispanic Americans um, and in different parts of the country, everybody, yes, uh, the Cuban Americans in um, Florida, but also a lot of um, Hispanic Americans in Southern Texas. Oh, this was gonna be the year we're gonna win Texas never bet this is going to be the year we win Texas. You can go back over and over, you know, the mom with tennis shoes on and on and on and on, Beto on the hood of a car. Don't put your money on that, although maybe someday, but certainly not yet. Um, and what he has done is alienated um, certain demographics, um, educated Americans, um, single women. He has just absolutely driven away um, from, from the Republican uh, from the Republican Party. Frequently, he's on the wrong side of the culture wars, and the culture wars have been a major part of the Republican Party. And the question is, will they also be important to the Democrats? Because the Democrats have their side of the culture wars. And then how will all of this play with that small group of voters who are going to decide uh, in 2022 which way these things are going to go? Um, and so, you know, you'll have Trump hanging over all of this. How important is his endorsement? Will it still be important in two years? Some some people seem to think absolutely. Um, you know, and on the flip side, will Trump still be red meat for the Democrats, which is kind of ironic since most Democrats are not big red meat eaters. Nonetheless, we continue. Um, and so it is, is it going to be all about Trump? And Trump's been out of office unless he just hunkers down in the White House. I firmly believe he will just scurry off to Mar-a-Lago, eat bad hamburgers, play a lot of golf, and start up Trump TV. That's the Toby TV bet. You can take it or leave it. And then you have um, sort of the next round of leaders on the Republican side. Will it be the 2016 retreads, the Rubios, the Cruises, or is there going to be a next generation, the Nikki Haley's, uh, and perhaps some people like that? Looking at 2022, again, the playing field is stacked against the Republicans when we look at the Senate. Uh, the Republicans will be defending 20 Republican senators, many in challenging, challenging states, purple states, states that might have flipped. Um, the Dems are only going to be holding, um, fighting for 12 seats, and almost all of these are in much safer states. Um, the House will be up again, and that will be really where the battle is, plus governors and things along those lines. And so on the Republican side, you have the segments of the never Trumpers, the hardcore conservatives, and the more moderate conservatives. On the Democratic side, you have the resistance, you have the beltway powers, the Pelosi's, the Schumer's, and maybe a return of the Blue Dogs, sort of, I saw Manchin was on uh, television today, and so maybe that group will say, you want to get senators reelected, um, you better be a little smarter about it, and oh, look at this, six seconds left, and so I will yield my Starbucks to Tina. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, all right, well, uh, we've had our speakers now and we have about 20 minutes for questions. So if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and our wonderful colleague Pedro Falci will read questions. And then uh, for the very last couple of minutes of this session, I'll tell you about the next BU Student Faculty Forum. So Pedro, take it away and give us the questions. Thank you, Gina. This one came up while Professor Glick was speaking about polling. To what extent might the discrepancy between polling and the results be plausibly explained by some form of voter suppression? Um, I can take this first, although Professor Palmer also does a lot of work on voting rights and things that might have uh, um, want to weigh in as well. I mean, it's certainly another plausible explanation, I think. Um, you know, we'd have to think about where the where the biggest misses are. Um, you know, as it turns out, right, some of the more accurate polls, right, um, you know, this is anecdotal, but right, the polls were actually seen pretty good in Georgia, which traditionally has is, is frequently highlighted as a place where we would, um, uh, you know, that's become quite infamous for voter suppression, although they, they have made some progress on voter registration and things like that. And there's obviously been a lot of effort to overcome um, the barriers to voting there. But, um, you know, I think it's another, it's another possibility, um, you know, just like all the other possibilities I threw out there, I think it's too early to, to say anything definitive about any of them. Um, it'll certainly, it's a good question. It'll certainly be in the mix of, of things we consider when trying to figure out what might explain that discrepancy. So thanks for bringing that, bringing that one up. Um, let me just add, let me add very briefly um, that I, I agree it is early and it's, I think we're rushing to judge the polls too quickly. Um, without final numbers in a lot of places and where a lot of places are still counting a lot of votes. Um, California and New York, for example, just have you know, hundreds of thousands of ballots left to count. Um, we did see very high turnout in heavily minority areas in uh, cities and neighborhoods. And so that's some indication that you know, widespread voter suppression is probably not um, accounting for some of the polls being off. We also saw very high turnout in pro-Trump places. And that's a sign that the polls might not be off because of voter suppression, but because of a turnout model just missing uh, a lot of people who are actually voting, who the pollsters, for whatever reason, either weren't reaching them or thought wouldn't be voting. So not a ton yet to say about the effect of voter suppression uh, on polling errors, but I think really also too soon to, to draw any strong conclusions. All right, I assume this comes from a student who says, we talked about this with Professor Mattioli in PO301 today. I am wondering what each of you thinks will be President-elect Biden's biggest task when he first enters office. Joe Biden's biggest task on day one. Well, I sort of led into 2022 and I everybody of course thinks the challenge will be Mitch McConnell, uh, which it will be, but it will also be the House very liberal members, um, some of the more liberal members in the Senate, not quite as problematic, um, but I think it's going to be sort of the push-pull between um, we finally, after four horrid years, now have to correct everything and will perhaps overcorrect um, in, in the eyes of many of the mo moderate voters who are going to decide 2022. But that might be a little optimistic that that's going to be the biggest problem he faces. I think it's going to be COVID and the economy, both, how to deal with both of those things. And one thing that most of most Americans won't pay attention to, but will be really crucial, I think, is our international relations, um, getting us back into our relations with the world, the WHO, the Paris Climate Accord. Um, and, and having those conversations across the globe where we're going to turn, I think, from having our best friends be the autocrats like Erdogan um, to turning back to some of the democracies and, and, and trying to figure out where we are now with, with so much having been broken over the last few years. Okay, question from Annika, who I understand is a, is a student of both Professor Sapiro and Berkowitz. Yay. 
to the point that there is a post-election infighting among progressive and centrist Democrats, one panelist criticized whether progressive messaging was to blame for losing House seats. But progressive wings like AOC argue that those who shied away from the messaging lost seats. They also point instead to criticizing the Lincoln Project. What are your thoughts on these points and whether the Lincoln Project was effective or not? She's your student, Gina, go ahead. Of course, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take a piece of it. Uh, let me start with the Lincoln Project. Um, the, the Lincoln Project, uh, I, I don't think had a huge impact on public opinion. Um, my guess is the Lincoln Project had more to do with those questions of the reformation of the Republican Party. Um, and, you know, don't mistake for a moment, they were Biden supporters, but they are Republicans. And, you know, I think it gave some Republicans a, a permission or independent leaning Republicans permission to support Biden. But I think that gives a field of play for people who are trying to figure out how to make the Republican Party not Trumpist us. Is that worth $67 million or whatever it is they spent, uh, you know, I don't know. With respect to the various fractures that you're talking about, Annika, um, I, I think it's all both and. I, I mean, you know, as you know, I've said in class, I live out in a rural area and um, all, all my neighbors, I can see it on Facebook. I can hear it when I, when I talk to people. Um, they, they really, really uh, were upset and turned off and angry and scared by some of those progressive messages, especially, you know, the defund the police and all of those kinds of things. On the other hand, the Democrats are trying for a very wide tent. And without those things, the progressive wing, the young people who went 67% for Biden would have been lost. And that is always the problem of a coalition party. Um, and, and both parties are coalitions now. The Republican party didn't used to be, but it is now. Uh, but the Democratic party is certainly a very large coalition party. And it means it has to be attractive to people who hate each other and wouldn't have dinner with each other. And it has to say things that different segments won't like. There isn't you know, we talked about the median voter isn't a real person. The median voter is just the middle. Uh, as far as the Lincoln Project goes, what it did was just bug the hell out of Donald Trump. Was that worth $66 million? Yeah, probably. Um, so that was very successful. And oh, the people who didn't need to have their vote persuaded loved it. I, I'll, I'm going to send you some research that shows that the people who you needed to reach were, in fact, some of them were alienated by it. And I'll go back to 2016. Hillary Clinton spent most of her time saying how horrible Donald Trump was. The voters knew how horrible Donald Trump was. Then it was up to them to decide, do I want to vote for the horrible guy or not? Um, and so perhaps the Lincoln Project would have been better served to say, why to vote? for Joe Biden um, rather than dumping on Donald Trump, who everybody has such, such a firm opinion on. Um, going to the other question, I mean, this the battle in the Democratic Party has been going on forever. Um, I, well, just as long as I've been alive, which might seem like forever. Um, but, you know, you go back to 1968, you go to 72, they, they nominate George McGovern. Oh, we finally have a nice liberal, uh, you know, and we had the bumper sticker. Don't blame me. I, I, I voted. I live in Massachusetts. So um, it depends on which state you're in. It depends on which district you're in, uh, how all of this plays out. I think the problem for the Democrats is the group that's advocating for, for the very liberal, if you want to call them very liberal issues, tend to be from very safe seats. And if you're from a safe seat, it's not a gamble. Um, and so if you're, if you're from a real battleground state or a swing district that was Trump in 16, you know, was um, Obama in 14, Trump in 16, goes back to um, the Democrats in 18, 
good luck um, with some of this kind of messaging. But that is for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party, and the Republicans are going to face a similar type of dilemma with Donald Trump. The first American election that I watched was the 1972 election, and there was a guy called Fred Dutton, who was one of the McGovern advisors, who wrote a book about the new politics. And it was all about how the Democrats didn't have to worry about um, awkward people like the white working class anymore, that coalitions that include uh, lots of young people would, would be the winning strategy. Uh, and uh, in the years since, I've uh, also, in, in the country I come from, watched various times, like under Michael Foote and under Jeremy Corbyn, when the Labour Party has said, if we give them a real choice, that's the path to victory. Uh, all I'd say is it generally hasn't worked out that way. I don't know enough to try to explain the outcome in any of the House seats that were flipped. I'm not linking that directly to the messaging. I will just say that I've never noticed a strategy of giving a clearer choice by moving uh, in a leftward direction for the Democrats or Labour Party to have a very uh, successful track record. Next question. Are there any major national security or other policy implications of delaying Joe Biden and his team's access to presidential daily briefings and other resources? Have we seen this in prior transitions in this country's history? Um, I can start that one briefly. Uh, on national security, there is. So, so one finding of the 9-11 Commission in their report was that the delayed start of the Bush transition left them less prepared for you know, national security and, and uh, dealing with issues like that. And that, that's certainly not to say that you know, a delay here is going to lead to another terrorist attack, but it certainly you know, leaves the new administration you know, shorthanded and scrambling to catch up in a way they shouldn't have to be. Um, one of the big changes, though, after 9-11 was they revamped presidential transitions to get things going earlier um, to try to avoid issues like this as well. But that requires the full cooperation of the federal government to make it happen. Um, so the less cooperation it is, the less informed the new team will be, the less prepared they will be, the harder it will be to staff that administration. This one comes to us from Rebecca. I've heard a lot of talk about the Electoral College and the Senate as two aspects of our system that promote minority rule. How could we design a better system where the minority has a voice, but not so much power? And how can we possibly achieve that kind of change? I, I'll just jump in very quickly because uh, I think it was um, one of my points that perhaps prompted the question. Uh, I do think that if we wanted to, we could build a, a, a movement to change, uh, the, to tackle the problem of the Electoral College uh, through a compact between the states to cast the Electoral College votes for the uh, winner of the, of the popular vote. Uh, I think the Senate, I cannot imagine a, a way out of this problem. I wish I could. I think it's um, mildly, not mildly, I think it is scandalous, but on the other hand, uh, I don't see any, any way out. Professor Martin, this one might be suited for you. Uh, how powerful is the right wing media ecosystem in deliberately providing misinformation in parentheses lies? How many people voted for Donald Trump on the basis of false information fed to them? Um, I would probably just say uh, you would have to count those people as, as people who were not trying to necessarily maybe educate themselves to the fullest. Um, I, you know, I do think, um, and I've never seen this in my lifetime. I'm not, you know, I'm not that old, but I've never seen um, NPR, Fox News, or CNN correct someone as much as they have with Donald Trump, you know, deleting tweets, etc. So um, I think that, you know, the real journalists, like I don't like to call myself a member of the media, right? I'm a journalist. So um, I think that real journalists and journalism um, made definite efforts to uh, refute claims by the president uh, that were maybe being fueled by, you know, right-wing media, as you say. Um, I, I definitely um, 
do believe that there was much information out there for anyone who wanted to educate themselves about what the truth was. Um, I remember hearing Steve Inskeep three weeks ago just saying something that the president had said. There's so many different things. I, I, I'm, I'm cloudy right now, but um, I remember him just using the word that was a complete lie. And that was said about the president of the United States. So um, if you have media outlets like the PBS NewsHour, NPR, CNN, BBC saying, hey, you know what, this information is inaccurate, then you do have an opportunity to educate yourself on what is accurate. Now, if you choose to you know, consume information that you know, you're not vetting, then that really is your responsibility uh, to make sure that you have the information you need to make an educated decision. That's my take on that. I just want to follow up on something that um, Dr. Martin said, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, Professor, I don't, I don't know which one you prefer, but um, the uh, one, I think, lasting legacy that um, uh, Professor Wilson talked about, um, I think, touched on of the Trump administration, but it was also raised here with the idea of inaccuracy is uh, it didn't start with Trump, but we use our partisan lens as a filter for distinguishing the truth. And so even if, for example, you're listening to NPR, the BB, you know, you're, you're watching BBC or whatever, if you, if you don't consider that a credible source uh, or worse, opposed to your president, that new information either will be not convincing to you or it will, will convince you of the exact opposite, right? So if they say, oh, you know, President Trump is really, you know, mishandle the coronavirus, you might say, well, BBC or, you know, C CNN, MSNBC hates Trump, so he must have done a good job. Um, and one way that people try to get around this is by relying on their social media. They say, well, if my, I, I can't trust, I can't trust the national news. I can't trust newspapers or websites, right? But I can trust my friends. And if my friends say, the president's doing a good job or my friends say the president's doing a bad job they have my best interests at heart but what we know about people who get their 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 uh political information from social media either from their friends or from that algorithm that magically gives you exactly the information that you already want to see um is that it really puts people in information bubbles so and and really gives you tunnel vision and i think one of the first steps to getting us out of this politicized relationship with the truth which makes dealing with any other issue so hard because we can't even agree on what reality is, um, is going to be figuring out uh, a way to deal with the opting into these very, very specified information environments. And that by, might, we might need to have Facebook, Twitter, the other social media sites cooperate on that. I'm not sure if there's another way around it. What are your projections regarding Trump's legal challenges? Will any of them stick? I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? Even if they win, I don't think any of them are big enough to actually make a difference in the election. So if you say stick, well, a couple, I think if you just want a couple of ballots, you know, even several thousand ballots to get thrown out, if that pads his ego, if that's like, oh, my margin was less than they said it was, like that, that seems like a really bad way, you know, way to use your last few weeks in office to me. You have, if you have genuine concerns about voter fraud, you could allocate the resources of the presidency in a much better way than, you know, towards forcing the justice department to investigate voter fraud it doesn't believe in. Um, so whether that's the campaign or, or, the, or the, the DOJ, I think e even if they win one case, there's, it's not gonna make a difference. Why is it so? But Professor Glick might disagree. <laughs> no, not at all. I was gonna, I was gonna, in fact, very much agree and, and just add to that. Right, the I think by far, at least for now, the most serious or credible case is in the one in Pennsylvania, and it only concerns ballots that arrived after, um, that were you know postmarked before the election um, arrived after, because the uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court extended the deadline, and there's some some question there. Um, the number of ballots at stake, even even if 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 Trump were to get everything he wanted, you know, out of that lawsuit, I think if they all got thrown out, or even if all only the Democratic ones out of that batch got thrown out somehow, um, the magnitude just looks um, unlikely to 
uh, to matter. Um, you know, the, the vocal, the, and um, there's also at the moment, you know, as long as the other states hold even a successful lawsuit in any, in any one of them, um, wouldn't be enough to flip the election either. So um, just piling on Professor Mattioli's comments. Why is it so important or necessary for us to have polls? What larger purpose do they serve, especially if they can sometimes sway election results? Let me jump on that one from a, a, a campaign professional. There's two ways to look at polls. There are media polls, and that's what everyone pays attention to, Wall Street Journal, ABC, Washington Post. And that's one thing. And the reason, in my opinion, they do polls, it's a great story. It's the horse race. Um, and most election coverage is the horse race. It's also pretty cut and dry, although maybe off by a few points here and there. So the media loves polls. It's a great story. Inside a campaign, it is totally different. Um, you spend more money on the polls. You're really honing in on certain types of things. Um, you're working with pollsters who have done this over and over again. Um, and so it's, it's apples and oranges to some degree. Um, and when I used to work on campaigns, I liked working with pollsters. Um, they'd help you with the strategy. They were sometimes partners, sometimes adversaries, but it sort of kept things on an interesting keel, just like all the other consultants you work with. So you just have to realize two differences. And um, I don't know if Tina or if one of the polls, polling experts want to sort of look at the, um, the media or the campaign side. Yeah, I think it's important what, what Toby is saying that you have to distinguish these different ones. The ones that we all hear about are the media polls. Um, and you have to ask why do they spend so much money because these things are really expensive to do. And it's, as he's saying, it's it's a story. It, it allows them to try to make believe they know what's gonna happen and they can fill in a lot of time it allows them to do the house the, the horse race reporting which political scientists and others hate but i think that's important we don't usually hear much about the internal polls but if you'll remember when most democrats were having a heart attack biden seemed extraordinarily confident um, and when pennsylvania didn't look very good he, it was clear he thought Pennsylvania was looking real good. And those are the internal polls and that's their internal research that are really quite different from what we're seeing from the, from the media polls. I think that uh, we're pretty close to the end. So if we were in person, I would ask everybody to applaud. And if this were a big Zoom conference, I'd ask everybody to applaud, but it's not so we won't see you. So <laughs> you, you can all applaud, but we won't see you. Um, if, I know there are more questions waiting and I think some people put questions in the chat. You can find all of us, you see our names and uh, I'm sure people would be happy to answer. I'd like to thank the many people who came out tonight to, to hear us and to participate in this. I would like to give special thanks to Pedro Falci, the guy who looks like a red balloon, um, who always supports us. He is, yay, Pedro. He's, he's just a fantastic partner of mine in doing this over the four years. Now, as I said, this is only the first um, BU Student Faculty Forum of this year. We are going to have one more in December and then a series of at least three in the so-called spring. All of them will be online. Given everything we've faced in recent months, I've chosen an overarching theme, which I haven't done in previous years, but I have an overarching theme through which we will investigate many specific topics this year. The theme is regeneration and healing, by which I mean, bringing health, repair, recovery, growth, new life where there was damage, disease, destruction. We will carry that idea metaphorically through discussions of a wide range of topics. For example, racism, violence, environmental destruction, disease. Our first in this series will focus on regeneration from racism and ethnocentrism. And that will be held on Thursday, December 3rd, 
from 6.30 to 8, and we will send a lot around a lot of promotion of that. That's Thursday, December 3rd, from 6.30 to 8, right here on Zoom. Our panelists for that discussion will include Catherine Kennedy of the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground, Professor Tim, Tim Longman of the Department of Political Science, and Dean Harvey Young of the College of Fine Arts. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion and then the ones next semester on disease, on environment and so forth, where we can learn how to maybe make ourselves better. And I promise there will be no singing of Kumbaya in that effort. So let me finish again by thanking all of these wonderful panelists and by thanking all the people who came and Pedro, the Thurman Center, the Dean of Students Office, the Department of Political Science and the School of Law. That's it, folks. Thank you.